Amen. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Pastor Sarah. Um, my wife's just pulling into the driveway. She's been gone all day on tours of various continuum of care facilities and nursing homes. Um, her dad had a stroke about a year ago, a little over a year ago now. And it's been a real uh, challenge uh, in, a, in a context where you can't really go into a nursing home. Like a year ago, they weren't letting people in. Um, you know, and they, they were basically locked down and they weren't taking new people. And uh, anyway, so uh, when you see me talking to somebody in a little bit, I, I, I just want to at least get the thumbs up that she's all right and the day went well. Um, I was joking a while ago, uh, you know, I was worried about this being ACC tournament week and there was supposed to be a game um, right at this time. Uh, but uh, after a lot of finagling, I was able to get them to move that game. And so there's not a game at this time. Um, oh, the power. Uh, so, so that, uh, you know, I, I didn't think I could pull it off. But in all seriousness, uh, that is just tragic to me that uh, a bunch of young men or women uh, on women's teams, but the, the Duke basketball team got pulled from the tournament because they had a positive test and it's their first one the whole basketball season one positive test and they're out, their season's done. I mean, so uh, it's, it's, it's sad. Uh, and so we, in, in memory of my dear father, who was a Duke grad and fan, we lament that reality. Um, so I'm gonna jump in and I'm gonna start with a question from last week. And it's like the big question of all Christian history and currently and forever. Uh, so um, somebody was bound to ask it sooner or later and, uh, I thought about bringing it up, but I didn't bring it up because, um, Wendy, I got your dinner in here. <laughs> so, uh, Wendy's here. She says hi. Um, because uh, it's it's really it takes a lot of time. I don't even like to bring it up in a in a sermon because there's not time to address it. It's a huge issue that that people have spent lifetimes, millennia, discussing. The question is. Um, is, you know, I'm hearing uh, that the, the people weren't doing right. They weren't taking care of those that are weak and needy. They have broken the sacred covenant with God. Somebody was paying attention. That's what I've been trying to say. God lets them be taken into exile. Yep, that's right. Many generations suffer for the sins of their ancestors. Um, and how do we reconcile this with our image of a loving God who loves like no other, a God who cares for such as me? Uh, that... Um, this is what you call deflection. Uh, I'm going to define what that represents. The theodicy um, dilemma, uh, Oxford Dictionary, the vindication of divine goodness and providence in view of the existence of evil, the question of theodicy. Um, I wanna say that, first of all, uh, even up until and during the time of Jesus, it was simply assumed that anybody suffering, Jewish or otherwise, is because of two reasons. One, they sinned or their ancestors sinned. That's why anybody would suffer. And so there was this strange kind of a sense that if, if something was wrong with you physically or mentally, emotionally, it's because you messed up um, or somebody else messed up. In fact, you know, the disciples asked Jesus about the man born blind. Hey, uh, tell us, Lord, uh, you remember this? Um, why is this man born blind? Did he sin or was it his parents' sin since he was born that way? And Jesus said, no, that's not how it works at all. So in many ways, Jesus corrects much of the Old Testament view. You remember the Sermon on the Mount? So much of what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But now I say to you, you have heard it said, you shall... Uh, love your neighbor and hate your enemies, but I say to you, love your enemies. So that, that vindictive, punishing uh, idea, certainly of God, is uh, certainly lessened by Jesus. So here's the theodicy dilemma, okay? Uh, and I'm, I'm going to not spend enough time on this, and it's going to be unsatisfactory, but I think that all of us would say, if we just considered these premises, these three things uh, separately, we would all say, well, yes, God is all powerful. Certainly, absolutely. Sovereign is another word. We would say God is good and loving. In fact, God defines good and loving to us. God is love. 
Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And then the third, bad and evil and horrible things happen. I mean, who can deny that? Yes, all of those are true. But philosophically and theologically, that cannot be. You know, either God is all powerful, uh, but not good and loving, or God is very good and loving, but just can't do everything. Um, God's not able. Um, there are forces competing with God that sometimes win. The theological dilemma of the ages. The whole book of Job is about that. Kind of a disturbing book. It's kind of like God and the devil make a bet, and God lets Job just completely get ripped, um, you know, just to prove a point to the devil. Plenty of the Psalms, how long, O Lord, have you abandoned us, O Lord? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You may have heard of that one. Um, the book of Daniel uh, has a lot of theodicy question. The book of Romans, especially chapter 8, especially 828, that says not God, God causes all things to bring about God's purposes. That's not what it says. It says in all things, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. In other words, God takes even what is bad and evil and can bring good out of it like a cross, <laughs> like suffering of God's own son. Um, and foreknowledge, causality, philosophically speaking, are not the same. They're very much connected. And then I mentioned the Gospels, the man born blind. So you see the dilemma of theodicy. Um, the bottom line is, uh, to the person who uh, emailed that question to, to me, which I really appreciate, because yes, I mean, you're absolutely right. So all of these people are going to suffer in exile for generations about something they didn't do, but that their ancestors did or failed to do, failed to do justice and righteousness. Yep, that is what Isaiah is saying. Um, uh, and it's, it's troublesome to say the least. Um, now, I'm going to share with you, I'm just going to jump to my way that I deal with this. There are many other ways that great literature through the ages, you ever heard of Dostoevsky? The Brothers Karamazov, classic novel, Ivan, one of the brothers, and I can't remember the other one of the other brothers' names, but Ivan says, as the Cossacks come through and take their bayonets and slice open the bellies of the pregnant women and rip the unborn children out of their bellies and throw them up into the air and then catch them on their bayonets. I mean, that's a horrible, horrible thing to contemplate. But what Yvonne says is, I don't care what else happens. I don't care if God sent a savior. I don't care if the world is redeemed. Any God who would ever let that happen to begin with is not a God I would ever want to worship or to be in control of me or to acknowledge even. Um, I would just rather take my chances of eternal punishment. And I think a lot of people end up that way, particularly folks with chronic illnesses and birth defects and victims of abuse. Um, sadly, I have had people who were severely abused in all kinds of ways in childhood, who as children wondered and told me much later, I wondered why God was letting this happen to me. How, how, how could God let this happen to me? Um, you know, I, I, I don't understand how this could happen to me. And uh, just last month, when, our, when my mother-in-law's dog was killed by two other dogs while sitting in its own yard, um, and one of our little four-year-old grandsons who just loved that dog, you know, just with big old tears, just said, I am really angry at God. Yeah, so are so a lot of the Psalms. So I think we just have to own that. We don't understand. Um, so what, it, what do we do with this problem of sin and evil in the world? Uh, and the classic sort of evangelical answer, even to this day, is free will. Well, God could stop all of that. But from the foundation of the universe and creating us in the image of God, God chooses to give humanity 
free will to choose morally right and wrong. And God doesn't mess with that. Otherwise, we would be puppets. And so, so God gives us free will, and, and, and we don't want to forfeit our free will. And the price of that is all this horrible suffering. Babies on bayonets and children who are abused. I mean, you know, again, Ivan or Ivan says in, in Brothers Karamazov, not me. And, and frankly, a lot of people think that. Another way Christians have dealt with it is ultimate things and penultimate things. Ultimate means final, eschatological, end times, all, when all is said and done. Penultimate means anything short of that. Sort of where we get that phrase, all will be well in the end. And if all is not well, this is not the end. Um, God is going to win, but boy, in the meantime, is it pretty terrible. And uh, and honestly, uh, so much of Christian faith, I mean, Lutheranism, I mean, sin and death are the big obstacles. I'm not, I mean, I truly, I probably should be more worried, but I'm not really worried about what happens to me when I die, because then I'm finally free of this body of sin. Finally, that's the only thing that will ever free me from it. Um, and the resurrection of the dead into which I am baptized in Jesus. I mean, uh, so, you know, but that still leaves the problem of this life. So here's my deal. And this is, I'm just going to leave it at this. And this is going to, like I said, leave a lot of things uh, unanswered. So if you'll put them in the chat bar, I'll try to respond or, or whatever. But I want to make sure we get into this stunningly beautiful piece of Isaiah tonight. So remember the original sin of the garden? I mean, let's think about how that plays out. Um, in the garden, God puts a tree. Now, why does God do that? God shouldn't have done that. God was jerking us around, right? Um, so God puts a tree, which is the knowledge of all good and evil. And of that tree, you must not eat. Which is to say, even though you're in the image of God, you are not made as a creature to know everything. Reminds me of that A Few Good Men line. Um, Tom Cruise to Jack Nicholson in the courtroom case. You can't handle the truth. Um, it's almost like God is saying that to us in the fullness of truth. The lie of the serpent in the garden is that answers are fundamental. If you eat of that tree, you won't die. You'll know everything. And the most important thing that you could ever possibly have is to know everything. If you knew everything, you're God. So answers are fundamental, says the serpent. But scriptures say otherwise about God. Presence, relationship is fundamental, foundational. Why did Buddy the dog die, says little Tal with tears in his eyes? I don't know, precious little Tal. I'm angry with God too. But let me tell you what I do know about God. And what do we know about presence, relationship, love? Scripturally speaking, the worst thing that can happen, the worst absolutely unimaginable thing that can happen is to be utterly and completely alone. We even get that hint at the beginning of Genesis, right? It's not, um, it's not about romance and sex primarily. When God creates the human being, um, what does God Notice after everything else was good. Oh, it was very good. And there was evening and morning the fourth day. Oh, there's evening and morning the fifth day. It's very, very good. God then creates the man and God looks at the man and women don't take this too far, please. Um, but, uh, but God looks at the man and says, Ooh, that's not good. Um, uh, so, so it's not about gender at that point so much as it is about community we are made to be in relationship presence with god and with each other and not to have all the answers furthermore if i did have all the answers would that make it any better for you oh well tao um i'm so glad you asked um little buddy who had his intestines ripped out uh, and was just completely torn apart well, um, God had a plan, you see, before the foundation of the earth. Now, does that make Tao feel better? 
I think that might make me hate that God even worse. Or like you've heard people in well-meaning ways in the line at the funeral <laughs> home saying to one another at the death of a child, um, well, you know, God just needed another little flower in God's garden. Yeah. I'm like, I hate that God if that's how God gets them. Um, I, I, you'll forgive me for my blasphemy, but I need to move on to, let me just, let me just pause for a moment. I just vomited a ton of assertions and stuff at you. And I'm not asking you to agree with me. I have no corner on the market. Yeah, well, um, Gloria says, you know, the interesting and very unsatisfying answer when God, when Job finally asked God, why are you letting this happen to me? I'm the righteous one. Um, and, and it's Job's friends that finally get Job to, to ask. And, and God is really flippant. God says, oh, Mr. Job, you need to know all the answers. Well, of course you do. But just remind me before I tell you, where were you when I laid the foundations of the universe and sprinkled stars across the sky and stamped down the valleys and filled in all of the oceans? What were you doing that day? Because I don't remember your being. Can you remind me? <laughs> um, and, and Job is like, Never mind. Um, you know, uh, the, it also is a biblical assertion, I believe, the book of Job, is that we don't know. One of the huge things that, that St. Paul says, um, you know, in that thing that we often read at, you know, at weddings, um, 1 Corinthians 13, and that whole part about Christian community, you know, now I see through a mirror dimly, but then face to face, um, now I am, you know, uh, fully known, then I shall understand, even as I have been fully understood, that the fullness of all things, you know, heaven has to be some kind of tremendous aha. Oh, oh, um, of course, <laughs> duh, yes, um, how wonderful, but not now. And so we live in that, that tension. And I actually get angry sometimes when I go places and people start answering things that they don't know the answer to. I think the, the single most common pastoral care answer is I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. Let me tell you what I do know and what I believe and what we believe. Um, yeah, living with the unknown, Gloria, you're, you're absolutely right. So uh, thank you all also. And Wendy, people have put in the, the chat that <laughs> pray in for your family and your father. So, Bishop, one of the things that you were talking about presents, right? And what's one of the. And I don't mean Christmas presents. I mean, <laughs> oh, PRE. Word. One yeah. of them is um, solitary confinement, right? Yes, that's exactly right. Go to your room, right? Right. It, 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 it leaves the table to, if you're going to behave that way, young woman. You and know. yet Romans 8, 38, right? Neither height nor depth nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come will be able to separate me from, from the love of God. Yep. I'm going to tell you. Anything else? If <laughs> I you're know making that. your little personal canon and your suggestions, Isaiah 40 through 43 and the eighth chapter of Romans have to go with you on that desert island as well. Um, because it's like Hall of Fame, awesome core of Lutheranism. <laughs> so yes, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ, but just as we're going to see in Isaiah 43 tonight, um, it doesn't say, you know, because I am with you and because I love you and you're precious and honored in my sight, you won't have to go through any waters. You won't have to go through any fires. It says when you go through them. So why do I have to go through those? That's a mystery. And in a world bent on answers, if we lose mystery, we've lost the whole deal. Um, yeah, so Roger says here, uh, God is concerned with our soul over material being. Um, to an extent, although we as Christians believe in uh, the resurrection of the body, that was a huge deal for the Council of Nicaea. Uh, you know, not this Greek notion of... Uh, separated body and soul, where we're disembodied somehow as this soul floating around in heaven, 
but uh, somehow because of the incarnation God in the flesh in Jesus that we believe in the resurrection of a body and St. Paul talks about that as a as a new body a transformed and perfected body one that doesn't get old um yes Sarah you, you God has to be bigger than what we can understand because remember we're the clay <laughs> God's the potter um even though I'm trying as fast as I can to make it the other way around all the time. Um, so uh, I need to go ahead and flip through these here. Um, all right. I'm just going to go ahead and because uh, just because of our time constraints, because uh, there is a basketball game on at 830. Um, I heard. Um, in chapter 40, remember now we have shifted. We are not in Jerusalem anymore under first Assyrian assault and Syrian Israel coalition assault, and then Assyrians assault again, and then Babylonian assault for quite some time. Um, and, you know, you've got Sennacherib and all these people and um, Nebuchadnezzar then finally, and they take in 597, they occupy the city of Jerusalem, which has never been done and is not possible. It is not possible. It's not even, no, this this is a dream because this can't happen because God lives here and the walls are 14 feet thick and we have, we have water source and we can grow our food right inside the city. Nobody can get us. Um, and the king will rule forever because God said they take them away into Babylon. And then the revolt happens 10 years later in 587 with some of the ones that are left behind in Jerusalem and they completely and utterly destroy the city. Don't leave a stone left on a stone. They, they just utterly destroy it. Put out the king's eyes after they kill his sons in front of him. And then, as some of the Psalms remind us, by the rivers of Babylon, we lay down our harps and wept when we remembered Zion. Even those of us who remember our children don't even know what we're talking about. And some of them don't even believe us that it was ever there. And the Babylonians say, play us a song now of Jerusalem. Come on, play us a song. One of your Jewish songs that your God gave you. Oh, wait a minute, your God. Hmm, I guess our God is stronger than your God. Or wait a minute, maybe your God never was to begin with. I mean the rug being totally yanked out from under you. No land, no descendants, no blessings, no king on the throne of David. Maybe it was all made up by our ancestors. There is no Yahweh. Or if there is, Marduk the Babylonian God is clearly superior. And from that context and to those people, this Isaiah, no doubt, or almost certainly um, a different one talking than talking to King Hezekiah back in Jerusalem and before, presents this scene as if the heavenly council, the angels and the heavenly beings, um, you remember back in Genesis, let us make humankind in our image, our image, it's very clear, there's plural and singular in Hebrew, and it's plural. So God's talking to somebody in the heavenly council. And it's almost like Isaiah the prophet overhears this conversation with God and the heavenly council. And God is saying to the heavenly council, so comfort, go comfort my people, says your God, and speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term. Because remember how long, how long, O oh Lord, that her penalty is paid. Now, penalty is punishment, right? Um, punishment is not always a bad thing. Punishment can be severe. Punishment can be shame. Punishment can be overdone. But a world without accountability and punishment and consequences, and even if it's not imposed by a human being, um, natural consequences of all kinds of things. She has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So the affirmation of 
God to this heavenly court that Isaiah overhears and reports to the people in exile is um, that, yeah, the reason you're here is not because Marduk's stronger than Yahweh. Of course, they would never have said Yahweh because you don't say Yahweh. Um, but the reason is because God sent you here. Our, our God's been stronger all along. This is God refining you. Um, you know, he is like a refiner's fire um, and purifies you. The, you know, um, your dross to consume and your gold to refine. Remember that hymn? Um, and then, uh, continuing on, a voice cries out. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Folks, this is word for word a Babylonian god ritual for the god Marduk, which people would have no doubt learned by a couple of generations in Babylon. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. But now they're saying it not about Marduk, but about Yahweh. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill be made low, the uneven ground shall become level, the rough places are plain. Remember that desert you have to go across? And wilderness either way, because even if you follow the water sources, you know, when you're not in a city, you're in the wilderness, you're vulnerable. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Does that make anybody besides me want to hum? And the glory, the, you know it. Um, but, but look now, so we're in exile, but who is going to be saved? All people, way back to the Abrahamic covenant. All people, all people, goyim, the Gentiles, everybody. Everybody will see it together because the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And remember, what, when the mouth of the Lord speaks, it is. Let there be light. There is light. That's that God. You know, let there be fish and creepy crawly creatures. And there are fish and creepy crawly creatures. Um, so, so God calls forth into being. And when the mouth of the Lord has spoken, um, you know, we say something similar to that, you know, um, the gospel of the Lord, word of God, word of life, holy wisdom, holy word, the word of the Lord, um, because it has weight. This is just a picture from the Arabian desert. You see why it might be important for there to be a highway there, trying to walk through sand like that, and why the rough plate, it needs to be leveled out. If you're going to be taking your kids, another picture of the Arabian desert. Also, punctuation matters. A couple examples. I find inspiration in cooking my family and my dog. I find inspiration in cooking my family and my dog. Right, Catherine? I'd like to thank my parents, Tiffany and God. My mother, Tiffany, my father, God. Okay. Um, or I'd like to thank my parents, Tiffany and God. I mean, it, it actually matters. Um, so in Isaiah 40, in verse 3, it says, but remember, there's no punctuation like this or quotation marks in the Hebrew. A voice cries out, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, which makes tremendous sense because the voice is saying, where are you going to prepare the way of the Lord? In the wilderness, because that's how we get home. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. All four of the Gospels have John the Baptist described as a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Um, that's a misreading of Isaiah, actually, um, because we know that Isaiah is saying, prepare the way of the Lord out there in the wilderness. Uh, now, I believe John the Baptist was in the wilderness because probably part of the Essene community, the Qumran community, uh, and uh, and, and was out there as an ascetic, monastic kind of a precursor. Um, but punctuation does matter, and we don't have it in Scripture, and it's really hard sometimes to figure out exactly what it means and who's talking at what time. Um, 
And then when people make a translation, putting in the punctuation is part of their interpretation, right? Because every translation is in part interpretation. And then a voice says, cry out. And I said, what am I going to cry? People are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. I mean, we saw that in Jerusalem, right? We thought it was, you know, impenetrable. And then it's, it's done. The grass withers and the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Hey, there's an interesting use of words in Hebrew, ruach, ruach, which means breath and wind and spirit. They're all the same word. And when God forms the lump of clay, hey, there's another image. I am the clay. God is the potter. Um, you know, so... Uh, when, when the breath of the Lord blows into Adam, what happens? He becomes alive. He's animated. The, the wind, the spirit. And Ezekiel, when the wind begins to blow across the dry bones, it's the spirit that's animating the bones that get up and dance and connect to one another. Um, surely the people are grass. This lamentation. Um, and... They fade when the breath of the Lord blows on it as well. The grass withers and the flower fades, but what stands forever? The word of our God that calls into being that which is not. The word of our God that says, Catherine Norris, precious child of God, you are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You belong to Christ. Your sins are forgiven you will inherit eternal life. And really, and frankly, regardless of what Catherine Norris decides to do with that, the word of God will stand forever. Um, now, Catherine can live a lie like I do most of the time, um, but God's word is, is forever. Uh, we are a word and sacrament church, but even the sacraments are that visible word, our baptism and our communion, because it's we, we hang our hats on that whole, on that whole deal. Um, I'm just going to zip on along here and look at uh, chapter 42, because again, survey course. Um, let's see. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is still chapter 40. Um, never mind. Okay, it says... Get up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Any other musicians out there who can't help but hear? O thou that tellest good tidings to Zion. Um, there's five different Messiah pieces just in chapter 40. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God is coming with might. His arm rules, his reward is with him, recompense before him. And another piece from Messiah, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather his lambs in his arms, and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead the mother sheep. So this God of vengeance and punishment that we've just been told at the beginning of the chapter is the reason we're here. Because we didn't do justice and righteousness. And again, that's problematic for some of us. We struggle with that because that's not the God we would entirely want. Uh, C.S. Lewis describes it in uh, Chronicles of Narnia about the lion, the Christ figure, Aslan. And Lucy says at some point, is he tame? And Mr. Tumnus says, uh, oh, no, 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 he's not tame. He's, he's quite dangerous and fearsome. Uh, but he's very good, <laughs> you know. Um, sort of like the Wizard of Oz even, right? Um, fearsome, uh, terrifying, uh, but, but very good. Um, not the God that most of us grew with, up with in Sunday school, because we see God through the lens of Jesus. And then verse uh, 27 and following, um, this courtroom type scene where God is arguing why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My right is disregarded by my God. What, what are you talking about? You think I forgot you? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, and he does not faint or grow weary. You're in time out is what you're in. 
you hadn't been killed. You haven't been um, completely decimated. Yes, this has been hard. I meant for it to be hard. Uh, he gives power to the faint, strengthens the powerless. Let me tell you, even youths will faint and be weary and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. And they shall mount up with wings like eagles. And they shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. Hall of Fame stuff, right? Y'all know the hymn, Eagle's Wings. He will raise you up on eagle's wings, bear you up on eagle's wings. This book of consolations that we have here with beginning with Isaiah 40. Now, I put this, this is a slide left over from week one when I told you in preparation that there are four servant songs that a lot of scholars call them in Isaiah. And this little next piece from chapter 42 is one of the first servant songs. Um, uh, Isaiah 42 presents the servant to the world with the Lord's approval and backing. Here's my servant whom I uphold, my chosen. Many people believe that... uh, Isaiah is referring to Cyrus of Persia. In fact, Cyrus is named several places as, guess what? The Messiah, Cyrus of Persia. Why? Because he's going to whoop up on Babylon. And when he does, he's going to take people back to Jerusalem, which he did, and rebuilt the temple. The servant is bestowed with the Holy Spirit and given a task. You won't be surprised to faithfully bring justice to the nations while protecting the vulnerable, a bruised reed he will not break. Normally, this would be the king's task for a country, but here the servant goes further by establishing a perfect justice in a worldwide global kingdom. The fullness of all things will be all nations shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. So chapter 42, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen and whom my soul delights. I put my spirit on him. He'll bring forth justice to the nations. He won't cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. A dimly burning wick he will not quench. And he will faithfully bring forth, there's our word again, justice. I'm going to tell you, we got, we've had two or three call committees in the last few years who have put on their ministry site profile. I don't want any justice pastors. Please, God. I hope we have no non-justice pastors. I mean, it's a baptismal promise, right? Back to that justice thing, to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. Um, He won't grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his teaching. Now, the reason those four servant songs that are sort of some people think a little bit strangely scattered out in different places from in Isaiah 40 through 55 uh, is, or actually through 60, um, is that they just seem to be so descriptive of the person we read Jesus of Nazareth to be later on in looking back. Um, And then continuing on with verse 5 of 42, thus says the Lord God who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. Sedakah. Remember Mishpat and Sedakah? I have taken you by the hand and I kept you. I've given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations. Now listen here, to do what? To open the eyes that are blind and to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. See, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. This God is going to bring about something new. So what we are currently experiencing, real as it is, is not the last word, and therefore there is hope. But Bishop, can I interrupt real quick? Please. Somebody gave private messaged me. Can you um, 
ex define the word Messiah. Uh, Messiah literally means the anointed one. And Jews referred to quite a number of people as Messiah. And it was only probably in the last 200 years uh, before Jesus was born that it became more of an expectation of a specific person, um, a, a one person who is going to be the Messiah. But, uh, Cyrus is called the anointed, and that's what Messiah means, God's anointed for God's purpose. So that's what Messiah simply means. Thank you. But look what, um, thanks for sharing that. Um, but, but this is what Jesus does. You know, he, he, he sets prisoners free. He, he opens the eyes of the blind. Um, you know, so again, a lot of people look and, and see this about Jesus. One of my favorite chapters in scripture, I'm just zipping along because again, our time is limited. Um, chapter 43. So there was this, and there was this, and there was this, and there was this, but now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel. This is one of the 366 times in scripture that it says, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. By name means power, Rumpelstiltskin, right? If you know his name, if, if you have, know somebody's name, you can proclaim blessings and put curses on people and everything. To know a name, to call by name is an intimacy. Um, and it's one of the reasons the Hebrews don't call God's name aloud because, uh, because we should not be that intimate with God because God is transcendent and sovereign. So because your mind, when you pass through the waters, so again, it doesn't say, so you won't pass through the waters, but when you do, I will be with you. Is it an answer? Why am I passing through the waters? No, it's not an answer. What is it? Presence. I will be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be consumed. The flame shall not consume you or burn you, consume you. Why? Because I'm the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And very clearly speaking to Cyrus here, I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you. And then to the people of Israel, because you are precious in my sight and honored and I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. I mean, this is the great God and Lord of the universe. Who's talking to you for crying out loud. That you're precious to this one, honored and loved, not because of who you are, mind you, or who I am, but because of who God is. Why? God says, not because you're wonderful <laughs> and you've been so faithful because you haven't, but because I'm the Lord, your God, and I love you. Does that sound like parenting to anybody? Because it is. <laughs> I mean, that's what God is. Uh, uh, you know, so um, let's see, 40, this is actually um, uh, 43.5, not 45. Do not fear, for I am with you. I'll bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you. Remember, they're way far east, about 400 kilometers from Jerusalem now, or no, 600 kilometers. Um, I will say to the north, give them up, meaning Babylon and Persia, and to the south, do not withhold, meaning Egypt. Uh, bring my sons and daughters from the end of the earth, everyone who is called by name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. So this word, do you understand why they thought these prophets were cruel almost? Stop filling their heads with this stuff. It's over. If it ever was, it's over. Um, and we need to get on with our lives and become good Babylonians and worship Marduk, um, which plenty of people did, but not Daniel, remember, not in the fiery furnace. Um, 
And then the same chapter, don't remember the former things. Put that behind. Um, this is one of my favorite council devotion things when I go uh, to visit with councils to do planning because it seems that they want to talk about all, all the things they used to be. You know, that's kind of like me. Um, I'm 61 years old and the older I get, the better I used to be in basketball. Um, so, uh, you know, but uh, don't remember those former things or consider the things of old because I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Don't you perceive it? Now I'll make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. You see why these prophetic pieces were and are so central for the African-American church that derived out of a slavery experience, out of an exile experience where, you know, making a way out of no way um, you know. Revelation 21 picks up on that theme, behold, I will make all things new. So um, once again, I just kind of zip through a lot of stuff. And uh, uh, yes, God has called you by name, um, Ruthann. I'm, I mean, I mean in, a, in our Lutheran way of worshiping at least historically and traditionally i mean when we're it used to be that you didn't even have a name until you got baptized just like for a jewish kid you didn't or boy you didn't have a name until you got circumcised um this is where this is where you were named you had your you had your surname your last name that came from your family but your first name is given to you in the promise of your baptism that you've been called by name and that you're loved. Um, if you have a plan form, I can't remember the, the prayer form somebody here might that that uses as an example Isaiah 43 the first few chapters and says to, you know to suggest taking this is not good exegesis but it's a lovely prayer form taking the, the name Jacob and Israel out and putting your name there. Oh, yes. No, that's a marvelous prayer form. Yeah. Um, um, because I need to be reminded of that, right? Um, I, uh, I do that sometimes with people that I'm really annoyed with <laughs> Yes. as well. Yeah. Not just for my own prayer life, but um, I have to remember that they also are called by name and precious. Um, and... Uh, yeah, that, that's, thank you for that, Pastor Sarah. Um, let's see, other things that might be, uh, yeah, it does make you want to sing, doesn't it? Um, all, those, all those different parts uh, from chapter 40. Of course, that very beginning part was that opening tenor um, aria, you know, comfort ye, comfort ye my people, says, says your God, and speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Um, and then, of course, verse five in chapter 40, you know, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Um, yeah, there's just yeah, so, so much. And uh, I, I, not all of you maybe are just just intimately familiar with Handel's Messiah. Um, so I'm sorry I talk about it so much. But uh, if you as a devotional piece, if you got a chance to listen to it, um, you know, just pull it up on YouTube or something. And uh, it's just so comforting and so soothing. The music seems to match the gravity of this message that these folks are hearing who are so desperate for some relief and some release. Um, and I'm a, I'm a unapologetic preacher but and so forgive my 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 preaching but uh but i think that there is a sense in the best case scenario when as we grow old or diseased or in light, in the face of a tragedy um that our release from exile 
is being released from our body. Um, that that in the in the again not to diminish the grief and and everything else, but to say that um, hey, and so so you know we read these passages a whole lot at at funerals, um, and uh, they're just uh, they're just so, such a book of consolation. That's that's what they are. Um, Other thoughts? We have a few minutes here. Yeah, Jesus showed amazing concern for people's physical well-being. Um, so, so not just about, um, yeah, somebody had typed that, you know, in there. Um, somebody is talking, Gloria is talking about having discs of Messiah and using them devotionally. I have, I have my little, um, you know, this is how modern I am. I still have an iPod, and uh, uh, and I've got this big Bose speaker that it hooks up to, and and I've got one of my little playlists is Messiah. And uh, if I'm getting real anxious or something, it's a which has happened a time or two during a pandemic. Um, you know, we have two more weeks of our seven weeks together which then will leave us free for um, Maundy Thursday because we hope they'll be online, uh, some kind of worship service uh, that, that you can be a part of or in person if that's what your congregation is doing and, and able to do that safely. Um, yeah, I have also a soulful celebration. It even has Stevie Wonder uh, singing one of the pieces. And, uh, but it's, a, it's, a, oh, it's probably 20 years old now. Uh, but it's kind of a modern African-American adaptation of Handel's Messiah. Uh, if, when you first hear it, um, it's, uh, it's a little shocking. Don't forget that we turn our clocks ahead this coming Saturday night. Um, what people did God give in exchange for us? And who did he give them to? Am I reading this too literally? Ah, I don't know if you're reading it too too literally. Um, uh, but you know, there's there's all this about the nations. I think that it's speaking pretty specifically uh, about Babylon. Um, that Babylon's going to be uh, destroyed because there is in the Old Testament. There's just no denying it. A lot of this vindication. But but even so, with all of vindication, those servant songs sprinkled throughout Isaiah talk about the one who did not hide his face from shame and spitting, and those who pulled out the beard, which it is quoted about Jesus, that same thing, so that that this new thing that it seems God is about to bring forth seems to be the end of that military conquest that's what God is about. Um, I guess uh, also to Ken and Donna's uh, question, um, yeah, well, literal is one good way to read scripture. I mean, it's not the only way, and it's, I don't think it's the fullness. I think that we limit scripture if it's, if we just look at it literally, but uh, Luther always said that, you know, that's the first reading. <laughs> It is what it says it is, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, but then we go, you know, picking it apart um, and trying to find the, the hidden meanings that are there. Uh, so what peoples are given in exchange for us? Maybe Jesus, right? Uh, maybe this ultimate sacrifice of Jesus. Uh, Roger talks about a baptismal name. Uh, Putting, putting the old off and the new spirit on. It used to be that you, everybody, including in the early church, when it was all adults, uh, down in catacombs and so forth with water flowing through, um, you were baptized naked, I mean, literally naked, physically naked. And when you came up out of the water, they held up a white wrap for you. And 
so that everybody wouldn't see your nakedness, but also that as you came out, they put it around you to, to warm you up, but it was your baptismal garment that wrapped you in the garment of Christ. And so probably, Roger, as a Catholic, you got a baptismal gown. That's the origin of those cute little baptismal gowns that we pass down from generation to generation with all the lace on them and everything. And um, and grandmothers are so worried the child's going to spit up on them or, you know, whatever, because it's, uh, it's, it's symbolic of the old baptismal garment where it says that we put on Christ. That in our baptism, God God can't see to him anymore. I mean, it's, are there some things God can't do? Yeah, God can't see Tim anymore because God can only see Tim even with all of his sin and mortality as a precious child of God baptized into Christ. And Christ becomes our advocate, our intermediary, our, our helper. And, so, a lot, yeah, I'm glad people are sharing these wonderful versions of, uh, of Messiah. There's a wonderful version out there in the, um, the Handel and Haydn Society with, uh, oh, his name has escaped me now. Um, he's, he's a Japanese uh, conductor. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you, if you get a chance to read these chapters... Uh, next time we're, um, you know, we're not right in, we're still in the book of consolations, but we've, like I said, we're only going to have one week in third Isaiah. So we've got one more week next week in second Isaiah. Uh, it's time for us to go. Ooh, before we do, let me give a shout out. That brilliant question. It was actually probably my brother's wife who asked it was Ken and Donna. That's my brother and his wife. Shout out. Nice. Yeah, I know. Right. I think my dad's here somewhere too. So. Yeah, well, I saw that swallow, S-O-I-L-E-A-U, is that right? Um, and I thought that was your name. <laughs> so, cool. Yeah, I don't think I have relatives on here, but if I do, they're too embarrassed to make themselves known. So, um, my sister was with us last uh, last fall during Mark, because she might be here, who knows. But God's blessings to you. Um, Peace and uh, hope to see you next week. Thanks, Sean.